Yeah, water would be nice. Yeah. For the throat. All right, um, we are live. I can see that on my uh, phone here. So that means, and I see already a lot of people onboarding and we already have 30 people in just a few seconds. Uh, wonderful. It's been a while since we've been um, online uh, uh, in the last few weeks. We've been really busy, uh, you know, building our apps and, and, and focusing on a lot of, uh, you know, products and services that we're launching in the market. Um, I have a very special guest actually in this uh, in this live session. So in a way, it's a beautiful way to start 2021 uh, with a great uh, sort of entrance to one of our solid and robust uh, uh, and reliable partners in the last two years. I can say, um, it, uh, let me give you a bit of a brief introduction onto how it started. And this is an example of how uh, a revolution starts slowly and easily. They don't always have a dramatic entry into the market. And I'm sure Falk will uh, explain to you uh, uh, exactly how it is going. Just like the Twitter theme you have, right? How it was and how is it now kind of themes that you see on Twitter, how it started, how it's now. Um, so how it started, uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago, our head of research, uh, and you guys know her already very well, uh, Dr. Ji Mei, she uh, was doing her PhD uh, at Charité uh, Medical College in Berlin, one of the top medical institutions in Europe and also in the world. Uh, and she connected me to, uh, to Dr. Uh, Falk and Dr. Joachim. Uh, and Dr. Falk is head of dentistry in, in Charité. We had a conversation around how to solve the problem of getting uh, to understand uh, the dental um, uh, data and, and you know, there's not much work being done on dental data uh, all over the world. There've been a lot of theoretical research. People have done some stuff, um, and obviously, you know, from from subject matter expertise, we wanted to uh, understand how the dentists are working on on this data. My initial conversation, so I was introduced to Dr. Falk and uh, and his colleagues, and my initial conversation led to um, a very pragmatic, down to earth, hard working, and a guy actually is. Uh, super interested in deep learning, but with his feet firmly built into the domain expertise, which is what medical industry needs. Uh, people understanding their domain, obviously, you know, Dr. Paul is not just uh, um, head of uh, uh, in the dentistry department. He's also worked with uh, national leaders within uh, in Germany and has is, is also head of uh, AI uh, for, for dentistry organization in Germany, but he will do that introduction uh, to you. Um, so it, after our initial conversation, we, uh, we, we embarked on an interesting project that led to some wonderful collaboration. Uh, we were able to work on some really interesting models, uh, uh, deep learning models uh, to understand about uh, not just uh, uh, dental condition, but also pathologies within uh, dentistry, which is not so, uh, uh, you know, prominent to, to people like you and I. Um, so that's how it started. How it's now, uh, you know, that has led to a birth of a startup, uh, which I have followed and I've worked with, and we constantly sort of have conversation with uh, Dr. Fal uh, Shrendika and his colleagues. And, and it's slowly building up, and this revolution is actually going to be long and lasting, and it'll lead to some some really wonderful things. But I'm sure Dr. Falk will give his introduction himself. So, uh, so welcome to 2021, our first um, online uh, workshop uh, in which we're I myself will sit back and listen and learn more about the uh, world of dentistry uh, through the eyes of a dentist. So, introducing Dr. Falk uh, to the audience. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, uh, Falk. Uh, you, you know, what are you doing right now, and and how how did you perceive our relationship and our collaboration? Yeah, thanks, Terry. It's very kind to invite me here, and I'm very happy to be here as the first speaker in 2021. Hopefully, a year which will 
when you go upwards, I think most of us agree on the chances uh, of being quite high compared to last year. Uh, whilst I must say that for myself and also for our Endeavor AI in industry, 2022 wasn't, uh, 2020 wasn't such a bad year. We had lots of things happening and Terry, you just mentioned it, we had a startup founded out of the Charity Hospital, a startup for dental image analysis and computer vision using deep learning in dentistry. And I will come to that later on. We founded out a new department here at Charité, unique in the world, with it's focused on diagnostics, AI, and health services research. And so we are now on a good trajectory with that. But nevertheless, lots of things are happening around us. And for example, we here at the moment, we are trying to, to get that startup on track. So um, the translational pathway is hopefully soon concluded from an idea we had three years ago over some kind of sketches and first pilots to a medical product which is by now already CE marked and will enter the market next month and that's all very, very exciting and on the other hand we have our academic issues and topics and one thing which is very much at my heart and also at the heart of us here in our department is the robustness, the generalizability, the usefulness of any deep learning and AI models in medicine and I think that's also what you strive to do, Terry, and um, I'm very excited about doing that, and I'm also quite excited about our relationship and work together, and I will touch this very briefly later on this Wonderful. Awesome. And obviously, uh, to the audience, guys, uh, I forgot to mention, it should, obviously, it's an understatement to, to talk about that the field of uh, artificial intelligence and deep learning is, is uh, as much as for techno technologists and technophiles like me, uh, it is something we do it on a daily basis. But we realize that the spreading of awareness of AI and deep learning, uh, including those individual pathologies, whether dentistry, breast cancer, or even electronic healthcare records, and understanding uh, that information through the eyes of a technologist, as well as a medical professional, it still uh, it looks like a sort of a dark art. And we saw that. So me and Falk uh, and, and a few co-founders uh, sort of looked at it, and this is why, uh, and this is why how uh, Dr. Falk uh, through Charité uh, has uh, established uh, together with us. I've co-founded it with him. The focus group that specifically looks into how do we bring awareness. And I'm sure uh, Falk will also give you a perspective of a paper that has been um, authored by Falk, and I've uh, contributed to it. Uh, which we are uh, as in the process of bringing it to various uh, local, as in European, German uh, healthcare uh, uh, conferences, but also into the Journal of Dentistry. So there's a lot of work that is going on through the ITU WHO, uh, in which we, we believe that bringing awareness uh, into our professional fields and merging these domain expertise of AI and healthcare is, is a responsibility, a joint responsibility of both parties. But I'm sure uh, uh, Falk will cover that as well. So without much ado, uh, there's one thing I want to obviously sort of uh, would really request to you guys, uh, please do keep asking questions. So I'll just show you, for those who are not familiar with StreamYard, if there is a question, let's say, um, you know, there are some people saying a lot of wonderful things, um, then you can see I will post your questions like these. So Weibo, for example, if you're still on the call, uh, hi Weibo, Agarwal, post your questions and I will just uh, uh, you know, stick them into uh, uh, this uh, channel. And this way, it's very easy for me to keep sharing uh, you know, your questions. So uh, Falk can read his, the questions and answer directly. And, and so uh, uh, can I where required. So this way I'll keep sort of sharing information so that allows this conversation to be interactive because this is what we want. We want subject matter experts like Paul to interact with the community that is on technology side, including his peers who are dentists today all over the world looking at, well, how do I use AI to actually make things easier for me? So diagnostics can be not a matter of weeks or days, but matter of milliseconds work. And without much ado, I'm going to now share the screen which Dr. Falk uh, has prepared um, uh, for us. Um, and and uh, uh, Dr. Falk, please go ahead, uh, take away this conversation. And we are all super excited to, to listen uh, uh, from your subject matter expertise of this. Go ahead. 
Thank you, Terry. Yes, so you mentioned I, I will cover lots of things. Let's hope I will really do this, but I try. Uh, the latest is in the discussion, so hopefully at that point we will have everything covered. Yeah, my title here is Chances, Challenges, Lessons Learned, Deep Learning, AI, and Dentistry. Let's see if I can fulfill that quite ambitious title. I will briefly touch the motivation, but I think the motivation of dentistry is very similar to the motivation of other fields, although dentistry is quite special because of a number of things. I will cover that in a minute. Um, then I will explain to you a little bit why particularly dental image analysis is a cool field, a relevant field, and what kind of solutions we have developed, others have developed, and that we are already quite far in the market. There are a number of solutions and applications out there. As I said, the one we found out of Charité, Dental X-Ray, is one of them, and dentists will have them in their practice in, as I said, what do we have? The 15th in two weeks, for example, in Germany and in Austria. And at the end, I will discuss very briefly with you what I think, what are the perspectives for the future. Analyzing images in a millisecond, as Terry just said, is a cool thing. It's helpful. It's increasing accuracy. But that's only the beginning. Obviously, we are aiming for more, for more ambitious things. So what's particular about dentistry? Why AI deep learning in dentistry? Well, of course, we dentists, we also look into other journeys occasionally, not only in dental journeys. And we are seeing the potential power and that isn't something we already seen for some years now of deep learning in other fields. You know these fields. I mean, most of you will have some tech knowledge or medical knowledge, and both fields actively look at publications like that one here on skin cancer, where it was quite impressively shown that on a wide range of possible lesion types, you can see that on the right hand side there were more than 25, 30 different lesion types which were classified on the photograph, such as that one, how an algorithms at least perform as good as really expensive, really intensively trained and really scarce dermatologists. And of course, that is something which is interesting not only from dermatology, we also see this in radiology and pathohistology, for example, as you can see here, where we can analyze tissues, tissue cuts, and relieve the pathologist from the labor-intensive task, because it's the same with, like with the dermatologist. We don't have enough of them. They need to be relieved from every task we can relieve them from. Services need to be triaged as much as possible as in the dermatology example, so that not every patient with a suspicious lesion needs to go to the specialist. They can hopefully be treated for 90% of these safe lesions at the general practice, so that the specialist services, which are expensive, as I said, and a scarce resource, that they are relieved, that they are essentially free to really focus on the more difficult things, the more tricky things specialists should focus on. And of course, we in dentistry, we have not a similar, slightly different, but a possibly, possibly comparable use case. And that is also image analysis. And it's quite interesting that, of course, nobody dies in dentistry. So the relevance, you could say, well, it's only dentistry, it's only teeth, hey. But it's something everybody uses. Everybody has dental issues. Everybody has been to the dentist before. We know that in most European countries and also in the US and many Asian countries, Attendance rates to a dentist are 70 80 percent per year. And you can see that, for example, in the European Union, we have 350,000 dentists, in the US, 200,000 dentists. In China, numbers are not very reliable. There are possibly around 1 million dentists, that's an estimation there. And we have, of course, lots of imagery generated by dentists. And that's something you don't know as a patient in the first, because we're not thinking about it in the first instance. But nearly every patient average in Germany gets an X-ray per year, 55 million X-rays by dentists per year. That's by far the biggest medical discipline taking X-rays. Dental X-rays are the number one proportion of X-rays worldwide. So it's a numbers game. Nobody dies, but it's a numbers game. It's very, very frequent. And if you look at a typical dental X-ray like that one, we see a second thing. It's not only a numbers game, there's lots happening. It's not a small spot of a, dent of a lesion of your skin. There's lots happening on the dental x-ray. You have 28 teeth, you have caries, you have infections around the tip of the root, you have bone loss, you have fillings, crowns, you have the sinuses, you have nerve areas, you even can see calcifications of the vessels here. So lots of things the dentist can look at. The problem is with that diagnostic we are doing right now, it's a standard diagnostic, but it's manual. It's subjective, it's time-consuming. And we have the numbers to show that. We know, for example, that dentists are missing 
three out of four carriers lesions, early carriers lesions on radiographs. So they don't spot early carriers lesions in many instances because they're busy, because they're hard to see as well, and of course because a dentist is not a trained radiologist. They don't have four years courses of radiology. They have one semester of radiology courses because they're also surgeons, they need to fix crowns and fillings, they need to be oral diagnostics and oral medicine specialists. So it's just one small area of expertise in the dentist. And that's why they are not perfect to say the least. And as I said, we see the NIST stuff. We also see that if they need to diagnose and report that image, it takes time. We are doing this in our clinic and we measured that for a number of our dentists, roughly eight to 10 minutes to document such an experiment. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's also very difficult to talk to patients about this because these x are just black and white. Our solution, our idea, you see a first image when we developed the first models back in 2018 there, our idea was to change that, to increase the accuracy, to make it quicker to assess these images and also report them, and of course also ideally to provide a tool which allows the patient to understand better what's happening there. And it's very interesting, that was not our first priority by the way. The first two things, speeding it up and making it better, that was our priority. Our motto was better decisions in less time. Whilst we've learned until now, three years further on, that especially the patient communication is probably one of the most important things we are providing with our solutions there. Because for the first time, if I tell you there are crowns on that black and white image I showed you, you would say, where? I don't know. If I tell you now on that image, the, the pink stuff is crowns, you immediately understand what I'm talking about. So that's very powerful. That's another potential topic for AI, that it can do things quicker, better and possibly even support communication and the usual human tasks. Our tool which we developed, and that is pro probably something which you will see with many tools, basically is a stepwise tool. And at the moment, you still have to upload an image to a web browser, but from the 1st of February on, as I said, that tool will allow seamless integration into the existing workflow because we have combined our tool with a number of already existing software suites in the dental practice. Within only a few seconds, the image is transformed. That's how it was supposed to look about two years ago. And you can check our website, dentixray.com. It looks fairly similar. It looks a bit different. I think we made a number of improvements there and also, of course, optimized it in the daily workflow. But that's what we envisage to do, to detect bone loss, fillings, nerve canals, retained teeth, carriers, infections, everything within seconds. At that point, where we developed the tool, we hope 20 seconds, by now we have optimized it to three seconds. So the dentist can even not do anything else in the meantime. He can just wait there, upload, and within one, two, three, he gets it back. Fully augmented in the way of seeing it here with an overlay and also with that tooth map at the bottom. So there are many, many different machine learnings running in the background. There are models detecting and classifying teeth because only then you can assign the different findings to the specific teeth. That's very different from what you need, for example, in dermatology. There you only need a classifier. We have models which segment, of course, restorations, but also models to detect carriers, to detect apical lesions, infections at the tip of the root, and a number of further things. And at the end, after interacting with that system, after checking findings in detail, the dentist generates a report, which is automatically then passed onto the existing systems, the patient management system, the communication system. So it's really something which fits perfectly into the existing workflow, which is scalable, and which by now has accuracies which are similar or even higher than the dentist. Of course, what we are seeing is there are images, there are cases where we are not as good as we want to. That's, that will always happen because they are really tricky cases. But on the other hand, I sometimes see images and I see a lot of images which we analyze because nearly all of them at this stage where we are at, I've checked by myself, if dentists are uploading images, I check what they do there, and everything is fine, so I get a quite good feedback. And I'm quite surprised about a number of things which I would have missed, and then when the machine checks it, I then am guided to that specific area, and I can double check it, and in many cases I think, well, true, I would have missed it, but it's really there. Now that I'm guided to the area, now that it's highly than the machine. So we think, as I said, we are generating quite a lot of value. I spoke about accuracy, I spoke about the time savings, and I spoke communication. Of course, and that is something I want to highlight at this point, of course, this is at the moment all done on retrospective data. So we are testing our accuracy 
in the traditional way, everybody of you is testing accuracies. We are training and validating the models, and then we are testing them on the whole lot test set. We have really put a lot of effort into training and establishing a reference standard. We had four or five people, independent people, checking every single image, including a master reviewer who was a professor or a system professor in that area and really had expertise in karyology and endodontics and so on. And then we check the accuracies of independent dentists against the machine on their test data set. And as I said, we can show similar accuracy like experts for detecting infections, much better accuracy than experts for detecting carriers. But what we can't really show is what happens with that kind of information in the next step. What does the clinical dentist in his practice make out of our tool? Does he find it useful? Does he follow our advice? Is he double checking it? Is this making him faster? Is it making him slower? What happens in the long run? Does he take other treatment decisions? What are the cost implications over the next years? Because of course, everything I do today has sequels tomorrow, one year later, 10 years later, in many cases, 30 years later. So this is all something we are trying to evaluate now. We have set up a randomized control trial here at our clinic. We are checking how, for example, using an AI tool changes dentist behavior patterns with regards to how they assess images. We're using eye tracking for that so we can see where they're looking at stuff which, for example, people in commercial in the commercial area are looking at where you go to the supermarket and they test where to put the new, I don't know, bubble gums on this yeah. shelf, that shelf, and so on. So we are really trying to evaluate this in a quite comprehensive way to get a better understanding of the impact of these AI tools. And that is something I would encourage all of us to do more in the future. Building an AI tool is a cool thing, but the next step is evaluate its impact in the real world. Is it useful to the provider or the patient? Does it generate health benefits? Because detecting stuff doesn't generate any health benefits. Treating it accordingly and appropriately, that's the health benefit. What does it really mean with regards to its usability? Do I need to take too many clicks and thereby don't have any kind of time savings? That's, that's possible. We don't know that yet. So there are a number of questions around that. We are, for example, also running a study on patient communication here right now, validating if patients really find this helpful this kind of tool for understanding better the dentist decisions. That's all things which we only can do now that the tool has a CE mark, that the tool is a medical product and that we can really use it in routine care. Of course, I already said that there's a huge processing pipeline behind it. And as I said, we haven't started with this yesterday. We started with it in 2017. We have by now in our image pool, in our data pool, more than 150,000 images here. Not all of them are annotated but we have a good overview about them. We know the metadata. We have tried to acquire very heterogeneous data from other centers because we have performed a range of studies showing that, for example, the generalizability of these models is not always given. If someone provides you with a model which has been trained only on one center, at least when it comes to dental data, be very, very careful because these models are not fully generalizable in many images. For example, we tried a study where we compared models developed here from German data on Indian data. And we found that it really we had a drop of nearly 10% in accuracy. And we tried to find out why. And it was very interesting to see that it's not what you expect. You would expect possibly is, oh, they use different machines. And we showed, for example, that the Indian imageries were much more contrasty and brighter. Okay, that could have been the reason, but it wasn't. We tried to adjust for that. It didn't make an impact. What it was essentially was that these deep learning networks, they are so powerful that they are also learning correlation structures. So for example, when they detect a caries or an infection around the tip of the root, they know that this happens only on specific teeth, usually associated with restorations, for example. And that's something which was very different in India. They didn't have a lot of restorations. They had the same prevalence of the, the disease. It was as common as in Germany, but it was hanging in different people. And that was very interesting, and I think it's something which I would like to highlight to you, that we should do that. If we want to make these two more robust and better, we should do that. And that's exactly at the heart of what Terry mentioned, that WHO focus group AI for health. That's exactly what we are doing there. As you can see here, we then annotated these images. We use around 7,000, 8,000 images per use case, per pathology. And then we develop a range of models really using nearly every existing type of models out there, and Terry helped us with one of these models to train and develop them. I will come to that in a second. 
And we developed models, for example, you can see them here, for segmenting teeth using both bounding boxes, but also masks. This was one of our first decisions. And to be honest, it just came out by accident that we had at the end a data pool containing both bounding boxes and these masks. But in, the, in hindsight, it helped us quite a lot. I can't go into any details here due to reasons of data protection and security for data X-ray, but it helps us quite a lot to have both these models running. We developed models, for example, also for segmentation of restorations to relieve the dentist of the stupid task of counting fillings. No dentist wants to count fillings and crowns on an X-ray. That's incredibly boring. A machine can do that within two seconds with accuracies which are really far above 90% in some cases. And you can see this here. These are the annotations and at the bottom you can see the predictions. Everything we do is segmentation. Nearly everything is segmentation, so we really are trying pixel-based annotations and predictions. And you can see there that the predictions are fairly accurate and working quite well. Also, for example, for other use cases like that image or that image. You can see there these are the intersections over union, which are a little bit hard to interpret for me as a clinician. I don't care about pixels. I care about entities, fillings, and crowns. But they're fairly robust, and we are improving them permanently. And I think overall, that is something which works quite well. And as I said, we also develop models for detecting carriers. Carriers, you all know carriers, hopefully not too many of you had carriers, but maybe if you're uh, in the younger generation, your parents or grandparents had carriers because it was very frequent at that time. And you can see that, that again, our values are not perfect, but quite okay. And we validated them against experienced dentists. Seven independent dentists checked 140 test images, and we let the CNN, in this case it was a unit type CNN, run on the same images, and especially the sensitivity was much better. Especially the sensitivity to detect early carrier solutions. And that's, for me, quite fascinating. The model, the CNN, was nearly similarly sensitive on early carrier solutions, meaning new changes in the dental heart tissues, only some pixels affected, and advanced carrier solutions, big carriers, early to the, easy to detect. Dentists, of course, as you would expect, showed more difficulties in getting the early stuff than the advanced stuff, which shows us that obviously these models have specific strength we could employ if we really tailor them according to the use case and combining it with the domain knowledge we have. And that's something we are actively doing right now. We are also developing models, for example, to not only say there's a carries, but to say there's a deep carries, there's a middle deep carries, there's a very early carries which then allows us in the next step to provide the dentist with treatment options. And then we are stepwise moving away from a pure detection tool towards something which may even change the treatment workflow, which may improve mm -hmm. what dentists do with that information. That's then where, from my point of view as a clinician, that's where it really gets exciting. Because we are not only getting him better in diagnostics and making him quicker, we are hopefully also improving the therapeutic options he has and guiding him towards doing the evidence-based things which we know and which we have available then. And we have other models. I don't want to go into too much detail there because I think it's not too exciting to show you all the models. On periodontal bone loss, it's very similar accuracies which are, you can see this there on the right-hand side, the, uh, the pink spots are the dentist's operating points and the models um, uh, the, the ROC curves there. You can see that the models in this case were better, but they were also not worse. But they're, of course, much faster. They can guide the dentist to tricky areas. They can assist him. And for the problem of apical lesions, as I mentioned, we worked with Terry. We developed a model which also showed quite satisfying accuracies there. Of course, sensitivity is something we can still improve. You can see the predictions in blue and the annotations there in red. Um, but overall, also something which is a solid basis to improve, and we are doing this right now, we are scaling up, especially for the apical lesions, the number of images and their heterogeneity to improve the generalizability as well, because this is a very tough task. If I tell you, find these spots at the tip of the roots on these images, without the boxes you would be lost, and we find this with the dentist as well. Detecting these minute changes in gray values and it's only a few pixels, that's difficult. And that's something where I think we can support dentists. But we can also support them with other stuff, stuff they don't see daily, like cysts, like tumors in the bone, osteoporosis, or as I mentioned, these calcifications of the big arteria here at the, uh, below your jaw. This is 
basically a risk factor for stroke. This is something a dentist doesn't see daily. And by adding to these, I would say, rather base case models I presented to you, adding some more, you know, you could say orchid models, stuff which is not too common, but really, really generating value if you find it and not overlook it. This is one of the next tasks we're having. And we, as well as many other research groups in the world, like people from Korea and so on, we are trying to push that quite a lot and develop things. But as I said, that is only the first step. I think developing an assistance tool for automated diagnostics is only the first thing. What I really want to do, where I really want to go is something different. I want to basically use, and this is where Dental X-Ray, our company, is going as well. I want to use all the data which we have. And that's the exciting thing about dentistry. We have lots of data. We see our patients twice a year, usually for 20, 30, 40 years. They don't change the dentist very often, at least in New Germany people don't do this. So we have decades-long history data. We have repeated clinical data, claims data. We have radiographs of the same tooth, the same patient, three, four, five, six, seven times. So we have repeated data which allow us interpolation. We can add to the radiographs photographic data, scan data, other imagery. We might even be able to mine the patient's own data. There is a trend in medicine which is bring your own device in medical trials, for example. So we might use wearable data, phone data, watch data, social media data, because we have lots of data about patients' behavior in their social media accounts. It's quite impressive. I don't want to go into any detail there, but it's quite impressive what you can learn about individuals. We all know the stories about Cambridge Analytica, about individuals mining social media data. We can use that to get better in our medicine, because at the end, we want to evolve. We want to basically leave the era we are right in now which is what I would call the area of risk stratification. We try to say, well, Terry, you come in my practice, you eat maybe a lot of sugar, but you also brush with fluoridated toothpaste, and you visit your dentist regularly, you are a medium risk patient for dental caries, and so on. Do we really expect to be very precise with this? No, we don't, and we aren't. We have the data to support that, that kind of basically very strange assumption that three, four proxy variables will really help you understanding what's happening there with the patient. That's not happening. That's not working. And that's why using all these different data sources will help us to really get more precise in our predictions, to personalize our care, to be able to work early on, preventively, before something really happens on the patient, and by basically employing his own data and then providing the feedback as well, make this a more participatory exercise. Having the patient as our partner in this lifelong journey of oral health management. That's really where we want to go to, something we call P4 dentistry. And I think that's really exciting in the long run. We are not there yet. There are lots of hurdles, data protection, many other things. But I think in the long run, we will hopefully get there. We have the tools, we have the data, we have the deep learning capabilities, and also the hardware infrastructure to use these data. And I personally am very excited about this. What do we need to do? I touched a number of things, and this is also where we work on in that focus group I mentioned and Terry mentioned. We need to get better with regards to sample size. We need to report on more than just F1 value or accuracy. If you're a tech person, please always report sensitivity and specificity, because this is how medical people think. And on the other hand, time I met people, please always report F1 values, because this is what tech people use. We need to showcase that these new tools are better than the existing gold standard, the clinicians. We need to do a fuzzy gold standards. As I said, we use four, five, six people checking the same image to overcome the individual limitations of each individual examiner. We need prospective, randomized trials. We need to check usefulness, impact on clinical cost effectiveness. And we need to do this within the standards we're having in medicine. We're not developing the new iPhone standard to recognize my face. If this doesn't work, well, then I just use my PIN code. Nobody gets any serious harm out of that. We are dealing with medical products here, so we need to scrutinize to appraise them according to the same principles we're used to, like in pharmacotherapy and anywhere else, evidence-based care. And that is something I think we are on a good track to. Dentistry needs to evolve. I'm very much pushing, Terry is pushing, and I think the more people push, the better hopefully we get, but I think we will get there. I'm very optimistic overall. So let me come to my conclusion. I think we are seeing the usefulness of deep learning of AI. We are increasingly seeing stuff in dentistry. We're 
bit lagging. We have been a bit lagging, but it's exploded right now. We had more than 400 studies using deep learning in dentistry last year. I myself, I'm very interested, but I'm, I'm losing track because there are so many things happening. We at Charité developed the software, the Dental X-ray software. You can check our website or follow me on LinkedIn to see it. And a range of models capable of making diagnostic tasks easier for the dentist. And we did that in some cases together with Luke Kaffer, with Terry. I think I'm fully convinced, I don't only think I'm fully convinced that deep learning will pave the way towards a better dental care. And in the long run, hopefully also a more precise, personalized, preventive dental care. And with that, I thank you. I thank you for your attention, and I'm very interested in the discussion with you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Once again, I think very uh, focused, balanced, uh, something we would expect from a domain uh, domain expert uh, to actually provide. And I think this balanced, uh, pragmatic, um, uh, positive, obviously, uh, but but balanced approach is what we need. Uh, my initial uh, sort of introductions into into the medical field were the same. I came from technology, uh, so obviously I was a little bit overexcited. My enthusiasm was interpreted in the healthcare industry when we were working with other medical projects, uh, perceived as uh, well a little bit overhyped. Uh, um, and I think uh, understanding professionals from both fields uh, takes time. Uh, that was my personal learning. Um, and it's funny because I started becoming a more pragmatic, down-to-earth, wait, wait, wait kind of person. And I was equally extremely encouraged to see that uh, in dentistry, but also in other areas where we worked with the uh, hardcore pathologists in Germany who've been doing this for 50 years, uh, um, that their enthusiasm, that the twinkle in their eye to be able to see that, well, actually this model is interesting. And I tried um, unseen data on, on simple tasks uh, uh, and it seemed to be consistent. Based on that, I think there is uh, a question I think that leads to, to, uh, to, to Dr. Falk as well. I'll just uh, uh, post this question here. Uh, so Fatima Zahra has a question. Uh, can you take a look at it, Falk, and see if you can answer? Well, this is exactly what you said. What, what I said. Um, the training phase is something I, as a doctor, I don't care. Don't show me your training data. I don't want to know. And I think people who show that accuracy in sample, in the training sample, and not anything else. That's something which was possibly interesting and relevant three, four years ago when we wanted to see if, if these models, models learn anything because we didn't know. But by now we know they do learn stuff, but the training data itself is absolutely useless for the clinician because he wants to know the performance of new data. So at least what you should do is you should have a Podo test set to demonstrate the value and everything I showed you here so far had that. We had Podo test sets for these applications and Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to go through the regulatory phase anyway. Um, and ideally, what you do in the next step is you test not only a one test set, but a different test set. As I said, from other areas, other populations, other clinics, other machinery, and so on, to really check the generalizability, because that's even, even harder than providing accuracies on the test set from your own population. Perfect. Um, there's a question I have actually. Uh, you know, I know you and I keep talking quite often, uh, Falk. Uh, so, you know, we are right now having conversations with a few medical institutions. Uh, one institution is asking, uh, can you build some kind of a, 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 a diagnostic model for various pathologies uh, purely on chest x ray? Chest, as you know, has, you know, maybe two or three dozen pathologies, and, and it's probably the most advanced and probably the most read most used, uh, 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 technically most advanced uh, industry within healthcare. What surprised me uh, in one conversation with a leading medical uh, institution without going into the names is that uh, uh, a radiology department within the medical institution uh, tend to find it extremely hard to find ready-made commercially viable and uh, obviously FDA slash CE approval is nice and it's important, but it's uh, it surprised me that even large vendors today, and I'm talking about the largest vendors who are you know the big players in Europe and in US, 
are still not ready with even simple solutions which uh, uh, these radiology other departments can purchase, subscribe to, and have some kind of a service from these uh, large players. Why is it so? Why do you think uh, it's taking so so much time? Because you are uh, in this situation, I would put you at, at, at the spot. You are the one who is actually talking to these vendors and, and you evaluate and you realize that it's, uh, well, you know, these are big companies. Uh, you know, these large European companies uh, who sell medical equipment, devices, and all that. Why is it taking so long for these things to become commercially viable and applicable? Well, I think there are a number of reasons. First of all, at least in my field, there are not too many CE or FDA cleared devices in general. So even if they would like to, these big tech companies would like to integrate something, a small startup developed a model or a software, there's not much there in the industry. It might be different in the field you mentioned. The second thing is, and that's probably more important, they are just very slow. They are big, big conglomerates and the processes are very slow. We are talking to all of them as well when it comes to dental radiographs. Um, they are interested, but they are slow. And the third thing is they are cautious as well. I mean, they obviously, many of them have the sense we are, as, we are that big and we are quite powerful. We don't need to be the first. If we are second, third or fourth, that's fine for us, but we want to offer quality. We don't want to disappoint our customers, which is a stance I even understand. So I think there are a number of factors and that was one of the reasons why at the moment we are also not closely and directly collaborating with a dental radiograph manufacturer to sell our tool, but with a more leaner, smaller company with a quite wide reach, uh, but out of the communications realm. So it's not a company which sells radiographic machines, it's a company which sells the software itself. Um, for patient communication. And they have seen the value of the tool very quickly. They are not a medical product, so it's much easier for them as well. Um, so a number of things are coming together there. And I think probably we need to wait one, two more years until these bigger companies are coming down that route. And until then, uh, I'm sure enough there is some value. I know you're building a startup as well. And because I talk to uh, you know dentistry clinics around the Netherlands, and my initial questions are indeed, you know, the speed of doing mundane tasks, like, like you said, you know, counting fillings, all these things is another extra hour or two hours a dentist is waiting uh, for. I'm sure that these solutions are definitely can be used as a second opinion. And then eventually when you start getting trust, uh, let's say your application, the dental x-ray, a clinic which has which serves uh, 10,000 customers uh, in, in 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 this region would be more than uh, they can actually quantify the use of this tool to actually save those hours and hours saved is money earned uh, because dental clinics are private clinics uh, you know they get some subsidy from the government but largely me you all of us we we we, we visit these dentist uh, clinic so for in this time of two three years, uh, I'm sure we can use applications like you are building or other applications uh, because they will continue to improve over time, and and they will probably be far. Well, I cannot say reliable than the big players. Uh, I'm just saying that you are putting all your energy and thought and technology into building this tool, so you have an an, an initial advantage above these bigger players, right? Well, I think we do, and I think they acknowledge that. Um, on the long run, of course, they have a good level because they have such a market reach. But nevertheless, uh, I think the most powerful advantage you have, we have, is the knowledge. Because you usually learn the stuff the hard way. The model itself is something you can probably develop, but the knowledge, how to get good annotations, how to basically uh, optimize the sample you annotate, and then how to build a model which has a useful clinical scope because you can build very accurate models which are maybe very very sensitive but not very specific and then produce just false positives that's something which i think is valuable knowledge and you can't just replicate that easily even if you're a big company absolutely wonderful i think this is a great advice to to you know the medical hospitals uh, and i was kind of surprised uh, with, with it was actually coincidentally uh, one of the person I know in the Middle East, and and they said, well, big players say that you have to wait three years. I said, wow. So what are you, what are you going to do in those three years? So fortunately, it's great. We see a lot of companies. Yesterday, I heard Page, uh, P A I G E, 
that's a big player. They just raised hundred million dollars. So we are only hopeful. Uh, and again, this is that pragmatist in me uh, saying that we are only hopeful that some amount of that capital invested will lead to advancement into these uh, into healthcare field. Because uh, you know, maybe it's a sidetrack comment, but what we are seeing is in the Netherlands. I'm sure in Germany it may not be very different. Younger people are avoiding to actually choose uh, healthcare as a profession, even at, at school, at the university level, because the problem is this. They say there is so much bureaucracy. I cannot be uh, a dentist. I cannot be, uh, 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 I don't know how you say it in English, uh, 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 a doctor for, for, for children, because 80% of my time, I'm just in bureaucracy, paperwork, computer screens, and filling reports. So I think if technology can start squeezing that 80% to maybe 40% and then 60% we can act actively work with patients, only then we make advancement in improving patient condition. So I think having said that, um, I know that you know there's not much time left. There's one question I would like you to answer. But having said that, I, I know that it's a great step you've taken to, to, to forcefully, and I know you spent so many hours publishing uh, I'm, I'm I'm really excited to see. Sometimes I find it like, wow, is Falk the only dentist in the world publishing so many papers? But in a way, it all comes to my email, so I read it with tremendous pleasure. It's a great pleasure to be sort of with you also in, in the World Health Organization, trying to work towards making this. But there's one question of this another gentleman, which I think you would also like to answer, and it's a last question since we are running out of time. Uh, if you could answer this as well. Yeah, that's the point. I think getting treatment data sets is only something you can either do in a, in a proxy environment where you simulate it. So this is, for example, something we're doing right now. We're simulating, just imagine you are not having our AI tool and what would you do now? And then in the next step, we are simulating you now have our AI tool. What would you do now? They can use it and then they can tell us, okay, this time we'll replace a filling or whatever. And we're doing this in a randomized controlled paired uh, trial. So we hope to get some insights, but of course it's not reality. This is a it's a fake approach, basically. It's a fake setting. They know that it's not reality. And if it's their practice, if nobody looks them over the shoulder, and if there's maybe a business to make or whatever, that might influence what they do. So the real the real data you can only get from practice-based research, from perspective, maybe not even randomized, but cohort trials where you follow up. Um, what happens when people use that tool. So we need these tools to be medical products and then we need to employ them in practice and see what people are making out of it. Wonderful. Oh, there's another question this guy has. So I'll just quickly. <laughs> Can ICD code say this happen? Does that treatment touch study? Well, ICD in, well, first of all, in dentistry, ICD codes are not regularly used, although they exist and they don't necessarily have any kind of treat uh, treatment uh, Related. What we see is we, we could use uh, OPS codes in, in Germany, for example, or for hospitals, we could use DRG codes if you have them. So yes, absolutely, using claims data and somehow linking it is a good way of doing that. Um, but I don't know of any study really using an AI tool and then afterwards comparing maybe the claims data before and after. I, I haven't seen that before, but it's interesting. But like I said, you know, we 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 reached the end. It's all we've already exceeded ten minutes of our time. But the questions were fascinating, and there are many questions out there. Reach out to me. Reach out to uh, Dr. Falk Schwendek uh, here on LinkedIn, or send us an email. We will forward it to to our friends in the Charité Medical College and and Dental X-ray, the startup that is. Uh, Fascinating, doing wonderful work in in Germany, and obviously I'm working together to try to see how we can, you know, expand this field together with Dr. Falk uh, going forward, and we will continue to do that. You know, last thing that I want to say to our audience is, healthcare industry, uh, as much as we know it's uh, it's indeed trouble, uh, is also the industry that uh, seems boring because you know people tend to focus on interesting projects. I would encourage a lot of, of folks who have been working in industries that are easy, right? You know, if you, it's easy to make an AI that uh, writes a book or uh, some kind of a meme. But I think, uh, think about it, it's, it's about making impact. Uh, and that's why, you know, I, I found a lot of interesting areas and problems to solve in medical domain, which I previously wouldn't have known. So please uh, sort of reach out. I hope this helps you guys, all of you, uh, sort of you know understand a little bit more about dentistry. 
and, and, and how you can apply your specific uh, you know, problems, not only in sort of dental sort of cosmetic uh, uh, exercise, but also in pathologies that probably are, are in your region, in your part of the world, in China, India, and Africa, still are very important sort of you know domains to look at and as dr falk also mentioned you know the number of dentists here in europe versus you know the huge quantity of people out there because there's a, uh, there's a uh, uh, patients that need to, to be served so having said that dr falk wonderful thank you once again this was great and we've been wanting to do this for the last couple of months i'm super excited that we started 2021 uh, with an important and when i say boring it's uh, it's almost like the boring administration that us will go into in the next four years but through this boring administration a lot of important work will be done there'll be less distraction and more important work healthcare industry needs that uh, we've seen that with covid we've seen you know how much important boring work is it saves lives and it improves your life condition Thank you. Uh, God bless everybody. And, and Dr. Fall, thank you once again. I'm so excited to, to see you, you know, present uh, and continuing your work uh, in Germany uh, in, in all these very important organizations, including your own startup. Thanks again. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.